Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Kung Fu Report, where we talk about classical Kung Fu's application. In the last couple of episodes, we talked a bit about the long fist, which is big extended movement, swinging power, which allows you to get a lot of power and a lot of momentum without a lot of training, which works really well for people that don't have a lot of time to train to develop short power. And of course, there's a risk factor to such a big motion, which we already talked about a few episodes back. I'll get Chris and Chilo to put the links below that you can watch the previous episode. Today, what I want to talk about is, because the movement is so extended in the long fist, some people say, what do you do if the guy's really close? And we're going to talk about this when we get back. Chris, sir, please come on in. So, um, let's say Chris takes a swing at you, right? And then when you do a big movement like this, in a few episodes back, I talked about how you can get a lot of power doing a big motion compared to small. So people are saying, well, if you're not in such a long range, you're such a close range, how do you make these long movement work? The fact is, when it comes to long fence, which is an umbrella term, it's the engine that matters and not the tool. And the engine, there's many ways to look at it, but one of the most simple ways, for the sake of keeping it basic with this clip, the main idea is using the classical stance, like the bow stance, the cast stance, and the horse stance. Usually when people look at these stances, they think it's impractical for good reason, because it is a static posture, which is unrealistic. What they have missed is, these are actually not static stances posture. They're really just like a picture in a frame of motion. Like we see a guy doing a layup and you start taking a picture. When you look at the picture, it's a freeze frame, but in actuality, it was one fluid motion, right? So these long stances are actually uh, still in time of a transference of force. What that means is, it's actually a big, long, lunging and falling momentum motion. That's the engine of the long fist. The tool doesn't matter. That being the case, if you have the right engine, you don't have to use the tool of a long swing. You can do it with a close range weapon, like the shoulder, the hip, the elbow, the forearm. Today we'll focus on the elbow in a very basic manner. So, that answers the question of what to do if you're close if you're using a long fist, right? But there's a catch. For example, let's use an elbow. A very common way of using an elbow, and I'm gonna miss on purpose so I don't hurt my friend Chris, not using a tip, I'm gonna use a soft part of my forearm to keep it safe. When I hit Chris, and I do what the basics of martial art demand, which is aligning my legs, torquing my body, and I throw an elbow, there is power, right? But, for example, if we do short fists like in Wing Chun, we start to develop a way of getting a lot more power without having to do all this movement that I just did, relying on torque. If I follow the chunk here, even a short movement like this, right, you're gonna be able to get a lot more power. Problem is, a lot of people don't train enough to get short power or inch power. So, but if you look at long fist, a big movement like this, and in practical stance like a bow stance, transfer into a dragon stance and into a horse stance. Look at realistic when you look at it in isolation. One, two, and three. But when you do it in one fluid motion, it's actually just this movement. When you elbow a guy like that, I won't do it hard because you know you get a lot more power even without any effort from being relaxed. And that is why long fist works even at close range. Of course, this movement can be sharp. I'm just making it big so the camera can see it. Another thing you notice about this big transference is, a lot of times in forms you would hear this stomping noise. That's unrealistic and not good for your joints. So why do they teach that? The reason is it allows you to learn much faster because you can hear it. And humans respond to sound a lot faster than sight. That is a timing device. I'm trying to hit Chris before I hear the noise on the ground. Now I don't have to look down. Because if my legs touch the ground before I touch Chris, most of the force goes into the ground. But if I touch Chris before I touch the ground, then all the force goes into Chris. This allows me to get power. What that means is, once I trust this power, I don't have to wind up my rotator cuff, which means I stop telegraphing. So to illustrate that with a few strikes, let's say Chris punches, right? Then you can use this big lunging motion for elbow. Then even if I don't train a lot, I'm gonna get a lot of power by lunging in like this, right? In the beginning, the same thing, I could be this way. But later on, you'll learn how to arc down because if I just come in this way and Chris can take a shot, he can still throw that shot or grab me or punch me or knee me in the head. But if I arc down, 
then I break his stance. When I break his stance like this, he can't punch or kick even if he feels no pain. So to follow the principle of Kung Fu, you never want to rely on pain tolerance. You want to make sure you break the structure. If he punches another way, he swings or something, right? It's the same thing. So are you okay? So by using the stance there, notice it's rock back, so you don't want to overcommit. You can get a lot of power, but it is not what people think. It's not the rotator cuff going upward, because this is a very weak muscle. Instead, you go upward, stop, and rely on the spear with the leg. So that's where the power comes from. If you, sw if you go straight punch on the other side, it doesn't change anything. You can still come in this way, and my legs are here. To get more power, I do not have to torque harder. I simply make sure the postings underneath is going. Now I'm gonna get a lot more power, right? That's one thing. And one more thing I wanna say before this is, it is crucial, if you do a long fist technique, yeah, that you have to be able to go back to short frame techniques. This is the reason why in most long fist system, probably 80 to 90% of techniques are long, but they always retain 10% of short techniques. So you can blend it with any short art, like Hakka fist, Wing Chun fist, doesn't matter. So Chris strikes, doesn't matter. But they go long, they can go back short, see? I did a long fist technique here, and then from here, I went back to the short frame technique. This is very important. Or if he swings another way, besides using a short technique here, I have to be able to, when he comes in like this, after this, if he strikes or something, take care of other possibilities. Because you never know if he's going to strike with the other hand. Like a long, I have to be able to <laughs> let it go short. When we get back, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Thanks, guys. All right, guys, so today's concept is actually really simple. Just keep three things in mind. Number one, it's not about the tool, it's about the engine. Number two, actually, I'm not even going to listen because I don't know how far I'll go. Second thing is, make sure you understand that the classical stands that are impractical are actually not impractical if you look at it as one motion. They were meant to be transference and not static postures, even though you first learn them by using static posture for alignment purposes. And number three, a lot of thumping and stopping noises that you see in a lot of the forms are actually learning devices that are actually terrible for your joints and not really that good for fighting. So they're good for your learning purposes, but don't look at them as an application, right? And the next thing we want to talk about, I mean, that I want to talk about, is that you want to make sure when you do long frame techniques, it links to short frame techniques without any gaps because you have to be able to play and drive your car in any gear. You go short, long, short, long, medium frame, it doesn't matter. But you have to blend it all together and not look at it as different skill set. This is very important because as soon as you have to think, it's too late. And then the last thing I want to talk about is, as you're working this, and I didn't really get a chance to demonstrate too much of this today in a short clip, but no matter what vector and what strikes that you're working on, you want to slow down and make sure that after you do a certain strike, you can deal with the guy's second strike, like I was demonstrating with Chris earlier. Rather, it's gonna be a punch, an elbow, headbutt, a knee, whatever, from different angles. And this will lead to a very big study, of course, right? But you want this ingrained into your nervous system so you're not looking for the next thing. It just happens with both thought, right? And of course, you get a long progressive program for that. If you're interested in this, it is in the full immersion program at amchankofu.com, and I'm happy to announce the long fist series volume one is now fully released all right and then the last thing i want to say is uh hey thanks for everybody for subscribing lately so comment below press like merry christmas see you guys next time